11 right here. What is the solution of this equation right here? All right, so that essentially that means solve for x. Okay, solve for x here. All right, so what I see initially here, we have a lot of parentheses stuff going on here. Uh, so most of you guys know that's distributive property. So that's 3 times x and 3 times negative 6 right there. So be kind of careful on this. Over here on the left-hand side, some of you guys are going to want to do this. You're going to write negative 6x, but then you're going to go and write minus 24 right there. Or, I'm sorry, minus 12 right there. All right, but what we need to do is distribute not just 3, but the negative with it. So it's negative 3 times 2x, which is negative 6. And then it's negative 3 times negative 4, so it's actually positive 12 there. So be really careful there on that. And then you still have the 8x out there in front that you drop down. Next step, I like to combine all the like terms that there are on the left-hand side and then all the like, and like terms that are on the right side. And on the right side, you don't have any like terms. you got x's with x's and regular numbers with regular numbers. You don't have anything like that. But on the left-hand side here, we can combine the 8x and the 6x. And that combines to 2x. So we're going to say 2x plus 12. You can't combine those. And then equals 3x minus 18. Next is you want to get your x's together on one side. All right. So what we need to do is subtract 2x from both sides there. If you have a positive 2x, the opposite of positive 2x is minus 2x there. So we're going to subtract those. Um, we're going to be left with x minus 18, and then that is equal to 12. And then we're going to add our 18 to both sides there. Opposite of minus 18 is positive 18. All right. With algebra, think about opposites. Always doing the opposite. So that's x and then equals, I guess, 30 in this case. So that means your answer is C. Now, I bet you some of those other options, maybe if you forget the distribute or maybe you don't distribute the negative, you might get one of those other options. So be very careful. I think that's the biggest error right there is that plus 12 right there. A lot of people want to put minus 12, so be really careful on that. That's all I got to say, I guess, on that one. Let's look at this. A lifeguard earns $320 per week uh, for working 40 hours and then plus $12 uh, dollars per hour worked over 40 hours. A lifeguard can work a maximum of 60 hours per week. Uh, which of the graphs best represents the lifeguard's weekly earnings in dollars for working uh, hours over 40 and that's the key thing right there over 40 hours there so notice all of the x-axis uh, on each of our graphs is the number of hours worked over 40 so we got to think here typically we're working 40 hours so after your 40 hour week happens right there you make 320 bucks so this is actually our initial amount Right? And since that's our initial amount, it's kind of like a B of a graph. If we're thinking in terms of Y equals MX plus B, that's the B of the graph. That's going to be consistent each week. We're making 320 bucks. Now, each hour that we go for overtime, we're getting that $12 per hour. And then we can go up to 60 extra hours right there. So now we're going to take a look here at which of these graphs could match up. So, um, we're looking at for ones that start at $320 because we're starting at like 41 hours, essentially. So, both of these two options here on the right-hand side, those both start at $0. We're talking about the m amount earned total. So, those options will not be good options there. Okay. Now, as far as some of these other options go here, we need to figure out which one is the better looking one. So this one here looks like you're capped off at about a little bit less than 500. This other one is capped off above 500 bucks there. And notice both of these end at 20. So maybe a good idea is to think about if I work for 20 hours for what are we doing? $12 per hour? If we go $12 an hour times 20 extra hours, how much additional money are we getting there? in addition to the 320 that we did for our normal amount there. So I believe there, if you multiply 12 times 2 is uh, 24, so then we'll just add on a, a 0 right there. 
but then we need to add that on to the 320 bucks that we made already in the week. So I think that's 560. So obviously, on this one over here to the right, that's below 500. And I know the other one here is a little bit above 500 right there. So that means G is going to be our best option. Okay, so be careful with the other ones, these deceiving ones right over here. You might get, you know, like this one ends at 300. It looks like 320 right there. So someone might see that and think it has something to do with it. Not sure really what someone would pick J for. Um, so maybe they're just putting that there as an easy option not to pick. So you have G on that case. And that's because, once again, went up to that $560 right there. Okay. Next one here, shoe company is going to close one of its store and combine all the inventory from both stores. These polynomials represent the inventory of each store. So you got store A and store B, which expression represents the combined inventory. That means we're going to be adding two things. We're going to be adding this one half G squared plus seven halves. And we're going to add that to the other polynomial, three G squared minus 4 over 5 g plus 1 fourth okay um, so when we're adding polynomials this is like combining like terms so combine like terms that means x's or actually in this case is g's so g's with g's g squareds with g squareds and what we call things without g's so those are constants, constants with constants right there. Okay. Uh, now, since some of these are fractions, we got to keep in mind to add or subtract fractions, you need a common denominator. I'm going to show you an easier way to do this here in a second, but it's, you know, it's good to practice some mental math here. So we're going to do the g squared, the half g squared plus the uh, 3g squared and none of those you know you could say well that's you know half plus 3 is 3 halves g squared but you don't have any options that look like that so let's talk about kind of what that looks like there one half and then plus 3 for the g squared stuff right there so remember to add fractions you need a common denominator that means I need to multiply the second fraction right here I need a denominator of 2 so we're gonna multiply top and bottom by 2 so that'll be plus, what is that, 6 over 2? And then you have the 1 over 2 right there. Those combine to 7 over 2. All right, so that'll be the stuff with the g squared right there. Now next, let's look at the regular g's, which we only have one regular g. So we're just going to put minus 4 over 5g, and that's all we got to do there. That one's nice and easy. Okay, and then the last two fractions, you have 7 halves and a fourth. So 7 over 2, and then plus 1 over 4. Now, uh, whoops, I need a plus on there. So that's plus 1 over 4. So now we need a common denominator, and we need a common denominator. They both need to be 4. So I'm going to multiply this top and bottom of these two equations by 2. That gets us 14 over 4, and then plus 1 fourth, which gets us 15 over 4. Sorry, I got my notifications coming up there. So that's plus 15 over 4. Did I miss any signs? I did not. Um, so I believe, yeah, it's got to be A right there for that option. Now here's the nice thing. If you're not really good at adding fractions in, uh, you know, with mental math right there and writing it out, you can actually go and use your graphing calculator to add fractions. So I'm going to put this to the side here for a second and uh, talk about how to do that. So, so check this out. If you go and back out of the graph, if you're in the graphing mode, you hit second mode, it'll quit you out of there. Uh, to write a fraction in a graphing calculator, you can hit alpha, the y equals button, so alpha, the green button, y equals, and then choose that first option, and it'll automatically make a little fraction here. In our first set of fractions, that was 1 half and then plus 3. I'm going to put 1 and then divide it by 2, press over to get out of there, and then put plus 3, and that tells us 7 halves. That's exactly what we got. If we want to go do the th same thing 
for um, for the seven halves and the one fourth, we can go alpha y equals. Type that in. Seven divided by two over and then plus one over four. Oh, whoops. Alpha y equals. Get that number there, 15 over 4. So with number 14, this one's actually pretty straightforward. It says the graph of the quadratic function is shown on the grid. Uh, what is the y-intercept of the graph? It's really you just need to know where well, or know what the y-intercept is. It's where it crosses, where the graph crosses the y-axis. Oops. So the y-axis right there. So the y-axis, this is the one going up and down. Now it's the point 0, 4. But look at what they're asking for here. They, they, you know, and I don't really like this one here. They say um, record your answer and fill it in on the, on the bubbles. And you usually can't put ordered pairs in as uh, as a you know an answer choice here. So I'm thinking what they're asking for here is just the y value of 4. Right there, you're gonna say y is equal to four. You're gonna to go to that little bubble chart thing, and then you know find four, and then you know bubble in the number, or actually you bubble it in, kind of like this, I think, and then you just put four up at the top there, because uh, you can't really put zero comma four. So that one's pretty straightforward there. Uh, I don't really know what else, you know, how you can mess that one up really. Just you need to know y intercept is where it crosses the y axis. Now if they change it up and ask for an x intercept. You're doing the same thing except where it crosses the x-axis. So that one's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, this next one here, a particular type of cell doubles in a uh, number every hour. The function can be used, which function can be used to find the number of cells present at the end of the hour uh, for H right there if the uh, if there are initially four of these cells here. So if we kind of know what a growth or decay type of formula looks like, we can construct this rather easily but I just want to think about it logically here so think about this We're, we start out with four things and then after one time we double it but then after two times you would double it twice or after three times you would double it you know three times kind of like that right there um, so we're going to put instead of like a number there we're going to put a variable we're going to say the number of hours right there so that's doubling it for each one of the corresponding hours and you start out at that 4 right there and that's actually going to be your equation you can put y equals on that other side I guess they wanted to use n for the number so I believe uh, answer b is going to be the best choice there on that now with that being said we can take your generic form of a exponential growth or decay formula and we can kind of talk about what the pieces mean here so that four that was the initial amount so we're gonna say a is an initial amount so it's a little bit different y equals mx plus b for this is like your growth type of things that kind of start slow and then grow really quick now b is what we call the growth or if it's getting smaller you can call it decay factor. So what are you doing each time? Are you doubling? Are you doing half of it? Are you doing a quarter of it? So a growth or decay factor. And that was, in this case, we were doubling it, so it's like we were multiplying by two. Now, if it was getting smaller, like dividing by two, you could use a fraction kind of like these options right here. So that's kind of a little quick tip thing on uh, those uh, exponential growth functions there.